morning, everyone. You're very welcome today. And we trust as we meet together, we will know the Lord's blessing as we gather for worship. Um, I trust you were watching through the announcement sequence. Um, can I just highlight a few and then one, one extra one that's not on the slides? Um, <clears throat> as you will have seen, we are having our music evening on Friday at half past seven. And uh, we're looking forward to having a, a good evening together. Um, so please spread the word. Um, still some posters available, I think. Yes, and little flyers. So if, if you want to take those and um, share those with your neighbours and friends, that would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, then next Sunday, we would normally have had our evening service tonight, but we're going to be joining with uh, Presbytery um, for the St. Patrick's uh, Day service, and that will be at half, I'm sorry, seven o'clock in Down Patrick Presbyterian Church. We're going to hear from Henry Coulter, who works in the International Meeting Point in Belfast. That is where a place where folk who have come as migrant workers or wherever they can come and then get help, uh, particularly about um, if they have to forms to fill in, uh, the English classes uh, and various types of help that they can receive at that place. So we'll hear about that, that work. There's some wonderful stories um, about how God is moving in that particular way. And then in relation to Friday night, um, Obviously, we're going to have quite a few people helping us with that, um, performing, uh, the, the two bands and others. So we're hoping to provide some refreshments for them over in the hall. Um, there's a little list in the vestibule with various items that we would need uh, to help cater for the folk. And if you can help with any of that, if you could just sign your name alongside uh, what you would be willing to bring along. Uh, that would be wonderful. I think those are all the announcements. Let's worship God together. In Psalm 45, we read this. My heart is stirred by a noble theme. I, As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. The Bible is full of what God has done for his people and continues to do. Uh, and so our first song talks about 10,000 reasons why we should come together and worship God. Let's do that as we stand to sing. <laughs>
Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. We come before you, O God, the one who is, who was, and always will be, the one who never changes in power and might, in love and goodness and purity. We bow humbly before you because you are the God who created all things, and that includes us. And we thank you, O God, that you care for us day after day. Undeserving though we are because we fail you, we do not live the holy lives that you want us to live. When you said to your people to be holy as you are holy, they failed and we fail along with them. And so we need to come before you and confess our failures. We need to come and say to you, O God, we have sinned. We have fallen short of your glory We have not upheld your laws. We have not loved you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and our neighbours as ourselves. And Lord, we are sorry. Truly sorry. And we repent of our sins. Which means, O God, that not only are we shamed because of what we have done, said and thought, but... Also, we have the desire to do what is according to your will. So first and foremost, O God, we come and we ask that we will be cleansed afresh this day. Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who rose again and lives forever to your right hand, has promised us forgiveness when we repent. So Lord Jesus, we come and we bow our knees humbly before you, And we say, hear our prayer as we confess our sin. And then comfort us with the knowledge that our sins are cleansed. They are washed away. And that all happened because you gave your life and shed your blood so that we could be redeemed. So as we meet here today, O God, help us to be mindful of what Christ has done. Help us, O Father, to be able to come with praise on our lips and joy bubbling up in our hearts because we can claim the love and grace of God. We can come and we can claim that we are the children of God because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, O God, strengthen us in our faith as we come together in our worship as we lift our voices in song, as we bow the knee in prayer, and then as we sit and we listen to what you have to say to us from your word. For that to be meaningful and for that to change us, we need a work of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that he will do his gracious work, he will be in our midst, that he will speak to each one of us where we are sitting, He will inspire us in our worship and then he will lead us out into a week of service for our God. So hear our prayer and accept the worship we bring for we do so through Jesus Christ who taught us to pray and so we can say together Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I'm going to show you a little picture here and I want you to tell me if you've ever seen it before. Have you ever seen that on TV? No. Maybe you don't watch adverts. Um, The bane of my life whenever I want to watch something and then every 10, 15 minutes, 
But this advert, which is about perfume, Miss Dior, um, it's not the perfume that interests me. Uh, it's not one that, um, that Mary would use. I know what she likes, so um, I admire that. But this one, it's not the perfume, but it's what is said in the advert. Does anybody know what it says in the advert? You don't watch TV, okay? Well, here's what it says, and this is what caught, caught my ear. What would you do for love? What would you do for love? Is the question that is asked at the end of the advert. Now, obviously, they are encouraging people to show their love for that lady in their life by buying this particular perfume. But it was that question that caught my ear. I'm going to show you two more pictures. There's the first one. And there's the second one. Now, one picture is obviously from Africa. And the other picture is from over in the UK. Now, they're very different, aren't they? They're wearing different clothes, or as that poor little child don't seem to have very many clothes at all. The mother looks very sad. The baby doesn't look terribly well. But over on the other side, the other picture of the mum and probably a boy maybe could be year seven, year eight or nine. When she's looking at him, they, these two mothers have something in common. I wonder, can you think of what that is? What would be exactly the same for those two mums? Well, I'll tell you. Both of those mothers were willing to give up eating a meal so that their child or young person could have something to eat. And you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, one on the, the one on the right, that, sure, that, they, that looks as if it's a nice house and, uh, and they seem to be well enough off. Well, if you have listened to anything that has been on the TV in, in recent months and over the last year or more, they're saying that people are finding it very, very difficult. Uh, and I have heard on, on the morning program or in the news sometimes where some mothers have said, I can't afford to eat and also feed my children. So sometimes I don't eat a meal and I give it to my children. That's what they would do for love. They're willing to give up a meal so that their children could eat. That's what they would do for love. I'm going to show you another picture. I wonder what's happening in this picture. Well, that is a picture, not the woman at the back, but the two lying in the beds is a mum and daughter. And the one on the left of your picture is the daughter and she gave up something very, very special to her mum. She gave her mum a kidney because her mum was very, very ill. What would you do for love? Well, that woman there, that young woman was willing to give one of her kidneys. Now, we do have two kidneys and we can live with just one. It's better if you have the two, but... She was willing to give one of her kidneys to her mum so her mum would not be so seriously ill and could continue to live. What would you do for love? Well, that woman gave her kidney. In the first two pictures, the woman were willing to give up a meal so that their children could eat. The Bible tells us what God was willing to give up for love. A verse that we all know so well. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten or his one and only son that whoever believes in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much God was willing to love us and to show that love for us by giving up his son. What would you do for love? Well, I know this is a special day. And I hope that we would be able to show that love to that person who's special in our lives. But what would you do for love? We have seen some examples of that. Mums who are willing to give up for their children. A daughter who was willing to give up something very, very dear and special to her, part of her body, to her mum. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we could have everlasting life. That is the good news of the gospel. The good news that God so loved us that he gave us Jesus. We're going to sing your song which talks about Jesus and we thank him for loving us and it talks about what he did and what's still to happen um, because Jesus is coming back again and if we are trusting in him we will go to be with him forever. So let's, let's sing. Thank you Jesus for loving me. Well, we've come to God with our prayers for others, and Mary's going to lead us in those. Let us pray. God, eternal and everlasting Father, we're privileged to be able to come before you with our prayers for others. You alone are the giver of every good and every perfect gift. You alone are the all-powerful one for whom nothing is impossible. Therefore, we can bow in humble confidence at your throne of grace. Heavenly Father, when we remember how you performed signs and wonders for your people of old, we dare not doubt your ability to do the same in our day. As we look around us and see the hatred and violence, the disregard for life and the devastation, we would cry out with the prophet Isaiah, 
Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Come down to make your name known to your enemies. Those who don't follow your ways are indeed your enemies. Today we call to mind those situations in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in Yemen, to name but a few, where war and tragedies are going on. Historic tensions are constantly bubbling to the surface. Claim and counterclaim, attacks and counterattacks are happening day after day. In the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray that there will be a resolution to the catastrophic situation in Gaza and that the hands of the evil one will be restrained in the war in Ukraine. For those displaced by the conflicts, we ask that they will experience your love and that those who claim to be yours will demonstrate that love in their words and actions, welcoming the stranger and providing for those in need. On this Mothering Sunday, we pray for mothers throughout the world, thanking you for the love shown and for sacrifices made. We mention with gratitude those who have been like a mother to us, a foster mother, an adoptive mum, and those who have stepped in as a mum in emergencies. We pray too for those for whom today is extremely painful, those who grieve the loss of a child, a young person, or indeed someone not so young. We think of those who have longed for but are unable to have children. Lord, we know not why, though we may question. Bring comfort and reassurance of your presence, we pray. Lord Jesus, when on earth you cared for the widow and the orphan, may we follow your example and look out for those who do not have relatives or ones who live nearby. We pray for social services and the difficult task they have in providing for so many diverse situations. We would ask that the resources needed can be found to alleviate pressures on the system. Lord, hear us as we bring before you the elderly in our community. For those who at times feel isolated and neglected, may they be aware of your love and power each day. We pray too for those working in the NHS and the strain under which they find themselves. May there be a resolution to the pay disputes so that patients will not suffer as a result. As we enter the season of spring, we pray for our farmers as they prepare the ground for planting and for those who are busy with lambing, give them the added strength that they need. As we think of seed time, we think of the seed of your word, Lord, and pray that as the good news of Jesus is shared, it would take root in hearts and bear much fruit, particularly in this Easter season. We bring to you these prayers and those of our hearts through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, through whom we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mary. We're going to sing again, and we've just been praying about God's power and how we can depend upon him for what we need. And we're going to sing a song which is based on, a, on an old gospel hymn uh, entitled Leaning.
come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, we are going to come to your word now and we, we pray that as it is your word, it's your word to us. And so as we thank you for those who wrote down the words for us as you inspired them, that we will take those words and we'll apply them to our minds and hearts so that in all things we will see Christ and him alone, his work, his plans, and how we fit into those. So, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know whether you've ever had the privilege or the pleasure of being high up in a mountain and looking across you have seen other mountain peaks and as you stand and look at them you begin to wonder how far away are those it's hard to gauge isn't that the perspective of where you are and where they are and whenever you see a peak oh it just seems to be behind that mountain but Actually, it could be miles away. We can't just figure out how close or how far away they are. In many ways, our Bible passage today, uh, which is a long passage, and um, we're going to just read some verses, but I'm going to preach from the, from the whole chapter. But it's talking about things that are happening nearby, and things that are far away, or we think they're far away, but we don't know how far into the future they will be. Uh, and so we're going to read from Mark chapter 13, and you'll see the verses there, and Palma's going to read those for us now. Thank you, Palma. Reading today from Mark chapter 13, Jesus speaks of the destruction of the temple. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and buildings. Jesus answered, You see these great buildings? Not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple when Peter, James, John and Andrew came to him in private. Tell us when this will be, they said, and tell us what will happen to show that the time has come for all these things to take place. Jesus said to them, be on guard and don't let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am he, and they will deceive many people. And don't be troubled when you hear the noise of battles close by and news of battles far away. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other, kingdoms will attack one another, there will be earthquakes everywhere, and there will be famines. These things are like the first pains of childbirth. You yourselves must be on guard. You will be arrested and taken to court. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before rulers and kings for my sake to tell them the good news. But before the end comes, the gospel must be preached to all peoples. And when you are arrested and taken to court, do not worry beforehand about what you are going to say. When the time comes, say whatever is then given to you. 
for the words you speak will not be yours, they will come from the Holy Spirit. And then reading from chapter, from verse 21, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe him, for the false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people if possible. Be on your guard, I have told you everything before the time comes. In the days after that time of trouble, the sun will grow dark, the moon will no longer shine, the stars will fall from the heaven, and the powers in the space will be driven from their courses. Then the Son of Man will appear, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. He will send the angels out to the four corners of the earth to gather God's chosen people from one end of the world to the other. No one knows, however, when that day or hour will come. Neither angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father knows. Be on watch. Be alert, for you do not know when that time will come. It will be like a man who goes away from home on a journey and leaves the servants in charge after giving to each one of them work to do and after telling the doorkeeper to keep watch. Be on guard then, because you do not know when the master of the house is coming. It might be in the evening or at midnight or before dawn or at sunrise. If he comes suddenly, he must not find you asleep. What I say to you then, I say to you all, watch. Thank you, Pamela. As you know my style of preaching by now, I'm going to try and help you to remember some of these things, although there are quite a few little headings here, so I don't know why you want to write them down. But they all the little headings all begin with BP, so um, if you can remember that, you might be able to fit them in when you read the chapter again later on. Jesus has already been in the temple. Uh, Jesus has been watching. And last week we looked in a family service about the widow's offering. He's already been answering the question about who is the Christ. Leaving the building, we discover that the disciples are looking around because as we discovered last week that Herod had been building this temple for many years, rebuilding, I should say, and um, it never really got finished um, during his lifetime. They were still titivating it right up to around AD 68. But the disciples are looking at it and they said, teacher, what massive stones, what a magnificent building. And then we have what I have, the first of our BPs, a bizarre prediction from the Lord Jesus. He says, do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left one another. On one another. Everyone will be thrown down. And I'm sure as they stood there and they looked at this wonderful building and the mass of stones that made up this wonderful temple, I'm sure they were gobsmacked. What are you saying, Jesus? This magnificent, wonderful building is going to be destroyed? It indeed was a bizarre prediction. And so they, they wanted to know, well, actually, when, when's this going to happen? Surely it's years and years, maybe centuries to come that that will happen. Because this is quite a, quite a building. It will withstand a lot. How far ahead is this going to happen? And so they say to him, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, uh, temple, Peter, James, John, and unusually, we have Andrew added into that. They asked him privately, tell us when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? They wanted to know, what's, how could this come about? Things are relatively peaceful at the moment. Yes, with the Romans looking after us, ruling us, telling us what to do. But for the most part, we are fairly, fairly peaceful. So how come this is going to happen? And when? 
They wanted to know when will this happen. And so Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out. Because you see, Jesus is working his way to the cross at this stage. And then will be working his way to ascension and back to his father. He says, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name. But he says, here are some of the signs. But don't get yourself in too much of a tizzy at the moment. There will be wars and there'll be rumors of wars. Now, at that time, things were relatively peaceful, but there were always those rumors that others wanted to come in and take over. There will be wars and there'll be rumors of wars. Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He said, but don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. That prediction that Jesus made and the signs that he gave are still happening today. Yes, they were happening in the time of the disciples. And in AD 70, the temple was indeed destroyed. And there was great upheaval. But the wars and rumors of wars have been going on through the centuries. For well over 2,000 years, we've had wars and rumors of wars. And Jesus said, don't, don't get yourself all worked up about it. These things must happen. He also gives other uh, things that will happen. And in, in other versions of um, the story, Matthew tells us the stories, so does look. He said, there will be earthquakes. Now, maybe just because we have got more information <coughs> and more communication, we are hearing more and more of earthquakes in various places. And they seem to be happening more often, or we're hearing about them more often. Again, signs. We're working towards the end time. <coughs> Pestilences or diseases. They are among us constantly. <coughs> Between viruses, plagues and other things. <coughs> Pardon me. And then famines. <coughs> now I know as a child... Growing up, we would have heard about <coughs> things in Biafra and in the country of Africa and lots of places. And <coughs> I don't know whether your parents ever said to you <coughs> when you wouldn't eat something. <coughs> the little children in Biafra would be glad of it. Did you ever hear that? I heard that. <coughs> Pardon me. But famines... Drought, all these things are happening around the world and we are experiencing it even today. Jesus said these things will come but the end is not yet. Do any of you watch Call the Midway? Mm. I know some people find it difficult to watch um, but it's, I find it a, a fascinating thing that of course, I brought the 1960s in, so the, the era that they're talking about, I lived through it. Not unpopular, of course, in London. And we didn't have Sister Julianne, Nurse Crane, Trixie, or Nancy, or, on, or any of the rest of them. And I know that some midwives today would um, be shocked and horrified <coughs> at some of the practices that are used. Uh, I read just the other day about some, some uh, person who was high up in the medical field and was complaining about how childbirth was depicted and the cutting of the umbilical cord and how many minutes you're supposed to do it uh, after the birth and all this. I find it a fascinating program. But 
In those days, you didn't have a mobile phone. In fact, you might have just had the telephone box at the end of the road <coughs> or in the next street. And so the birth pains, Jesus says here, all these things, the wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, the diseases of various kinds, the famines, these are the beginning of birth pains. It's the beginning of the end, but not the end. And so he says, you must be on your guard. So birth pains is the next BP. But then in the next number of verses, we have what I've called blatant persecution. And this is talking about the believers. Now, when this gospel was written by Mark, it was around the time that uh, the temple was destroyed in the late uh, in the late sixties, early seventies A.D. and the persecution of believers was powerful. They were dragged before the courts. They were dragged before the synagogue leaders. They were whipped. They were persecuted, left, right, and centre. And it goes on to say, whenever, if you look across, that what would happen? You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Whenever you're arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. But then it goes on to say about those who would hand you over. It says, let no, no one on his roof, it says, when you see the abomination, etc. It says, let no one on the roof, on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be for those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. Yes, people would be persecuted because of their faith. Again, that is happening in our day and generation the persecuted church throughout the world. We're not experiencing that persecution to the same degree. People may laugh at us for being Christians, but that's nearly as far, or you might be excluded from some social groupings, but you're not experiencing what they're experiencing in other countries where they're put in jail just because they believe in Jesus. They're being tortured because they put their faith in Christ. That is going on. So it is happening even today. But I hinted there about next BP, which is blasphemous practices. Verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand then that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains what are they talking about whenever they say the abomination that causes desolation that's a phrase from the prophecy of Daniel and in the second century BC the Greek king Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes he replaced the twice daily sacrifices in the temple not only that, but they set up Baal Shamin, Lord of Heavens, identified by some as the sky god Zeus. And even worse, they sacrificed pigs on the altar. That was complete sacrilegious to the temple. It was desecrating the, the temple, that which was holy for the people. And he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that it's Desolation has come near. Now, but yet still to come. Blasphemous practices. 
And indeed, there's Zeus and the sacrifice of the pigs. The next BP is bleak prospects, 15 to 20. Let no one on the river's house go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those days will be of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Bleak prospects for those living at this time whenever the armies would surround Jerusalem. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, that is those that God has chosen for his own people, he has shortened them. Bleak prospects. That happened at around the time whenever Jerusalem was surrounded and whenever it was, the temple was destroyed. And yet, that was then, but it's still happening today. So you can see, like the mountains, we see something, we see something further on. How far on is this going to happen? We don't know, and there's lots happening in between that are very similar. But I think what is important for us is the next BP, and that is brazen prophets. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if it were possible. So be in your guard, for I told you everything ahead of time. Throughout the centuries, and even in the last century, there were those who were claiming to be Christ. They were messiahs. Some crazy people over in South America or North America who claimed that they were Jesus. They were Messiah. And there were people who flocked to them and became part of their commune and they ended up killing themselves as part of this cult. Again, nothing new. People coming and saying, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you're waiting for. Jesus said, that's going to happen. People are going to come and try to deceive you, to get you to go away from the way, to go away from trusting in Jesus, going away from what God has planned. The brazen prophets, but then there was brilliant power because, but in those days following the distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, Men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, <coughs> from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. Jesus is now getting to the point where he says, I will return. All these things are going to happen. And they will happen probably over and over and over again. But the brilliant power that will definitely say I am on my way is whenever we have the physical creation doing something different. <coughs> the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the heaven and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, Jesus will return. And why is he coming He's coming back to take his church, those who belong to Jesus, to be with him. <coughs> he is going to gather his elect, those who are in the family of God. And he gives them a, a, a little picture. <coughs> Pardon me. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Earth and heaven will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Again, we have the now and the future. Some of the things that Jesus was telling his disciples at that time happened in their lifetime. They saw the destruction of the temple. They saw people being persecuted for their faith. 
They saw people being dragged to, into the synagogue. Didn't Paul do that with believers? He gathered them together. He rounded them up and he took them and he was going to throw them into jail simply because they trusted in Jesus. That happened then and it is still happening today. But there is that time when Christ will return. <clears throat> and that's why our last BP is be prepared. We go on, verse 32. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when, the time, when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Be prepared. I have read some books and in the past there have been many films uh, produced about the second coming of Christ. I've told you about the book that I read years and years ago, The Late Great Planet Earth. I heard sermons, many sermons as a teenager on the coming of Christ. And there are those who spend their life trying to work out the timetable, the calendar. According to that particular book, the Lord should have already returned. And we're still here. So either we're not Christians or else the book's wrong. And I believe the book's, the book's wrong. I remember sitting in the library. I was a librarian in, in Down High, and I can remember in the wee office that we had when we were on duty, we, the librarians usually had their lunch together in this wee office place. And I can remember having many, many discussions um, with other, other folk about Second Coming, whenever this was all uh, on the go, when we were discussing. And we said, well, if that's the case, and the... And, in the common market, now that, 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 that when they get the ten, uh, the ten members of the, of the common market, well then that's that's and that must be the ten horns. And, and they were trying to work out, we're trying to work out, and it got very confusing. And then we had to come back to this, this verse. No one knows about that day. No one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Nobody knows. So in the light of that, be prepared. Jesus is coming back again to take those who belong to him, to take them home. And the question that we need to ask ourselves, am I one of them? Am I one of them? Have I put my trust in the Lord Jesus? Is my name written in that book in heaven? as being one of the Lord Jesus' followers. And that happens whenever we give our life to him, whenever, as I said in our very first prayer, when we repent of our sin and we trust in Jesus for our salvation, trusting in nothing else. Because he alone saves. He alone can bring us before a holy God. His sacrifice alone, which we will be celebrating in a couple of weeks' time on Palm Sunday, as we think about his death, on the cross and what he accomplished for us. That's the only way. That is the only way that we can come to God. It's through Jesus. So all these things that are, going to, that are happening and are going to happen and will continue to happen until we have those powerful, spectacular Things happening in the heavens, which we don't know is when they're going to happen. If that's the case, if we don't know, we need to be prepared. And even if we are persecuted because of our faith, we are told not to worry. The Lord will be with us. 
And if we're dragged before the courts for being Christians, then we don't need to worry what we're going to say because we're given the words. We're given the strength. We are given the power to stand and witness that we belong to Jesus. So looking at the mountains and seeing the mountain peaks, some are close, some are further away. We don't know how far away they are. We don't know the valleys in between and the distance between them. It's like that in this passage. Things are happening. Things happened. They've already happened in the past. There are things continuing to happen, but there's this event still to take place, and that is Jesus coming again. And the question I leave, are you ready? Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for this passage. That it's, it is complicated, and that we wonder, well, what applies to the past? What applies to now? What, what applies to the future? And yet in the midst of it all, Jesus has said, watch, be alert. In other words, be ready. We pray, Lord, that everyone in this building today will know you as the Lord and Savior and are prepared to meet you and are prepared for that day when Christ shall come in the clouds to gather his people home. May that be so, for we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final praise talks about the various timings and about how one day Jesus will come back again as we sing, oh, praise the name.
let us go from this place with the assurance that we live in Christ and will live with him forevermore. In the meantime, let us pray for one another and bless one another as we say the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.